Hi, and welcome to Thinking About Science again, and today's lecture on Logical Investigations of Scientific Method. So, this lecture looks at two different ways in which scientific method has been investigated using logical analysis, and we'll examine the positivist's use of inductive logic and Popper's use of deductive logic. Now, the problem of demarcation is the problem of defining where, um, where, where we are supposed to draw the line um, and to demarcate between the scientific and the non-scientific and divide them into different regions. So definition by demarcation involves drawing a limit to the extension of science so that only certain human endeavours fall under this label. Um, consider both sides of this science-non-science -science divide. So there are some things that we might fairly be fairly confident about putting on the science side. Observation seems to belong on the science side. At least the method of observation, individual observations are not good candidates as some like pre-Galilean observations of Mars and Venus can have variable reliability. Experimentation also seems to belong here. Uh, and that's, again, it would seem that the method of experiment rather than individual experiments is the best candidate. Now, what about facts? What counts as a fact is dependent on the theory you believe. Theories can change and the facts change with them. Perhaps the notion of facts or factoids belongs, but that notion is a bit vague. Um, what about hypotheses and theories? Um, um, what about the hypothesis and theory so that these facts are part of? This is a bit tricky. Uh, much theory belongs to metaphysics, but by definition what metaphysics tells us about lies beyond tractable scientific investigation. Um, a question like, is there a god, seems a clear example of a metaphysical question, and uh, at best science can help shed light on the plausibility of different answers to it, but it cannot give us those answers. So hypotheses are mostly, and hypotheses, sorry, are mostly tools of scientific investigation, something instrumental as stress. Furthermore, if two tools like a spanner and a wrench can do the same job, loosening a nut, then it might seem that the particular tool is inessential for what we really, what we're really after. So long as we do get successful predictions, it might not matter too much how we get them. Now we can already suppose that at least highly speculative metaphysics belongs to the non-science side of the divide. Uh, it seems that at least some parts of religion might belong there as well, uh, in particular parts of the a priori relating to the interpretation of religious texts, uh, like Revelation, seem to belong on the non-science side. What about other parts of the a priori? Again, the situation gets tricky. It would seem that contradictions the Earth orbits the Sun, and the Earth does not orbit the Sun, and equivalences, or also called tautologies, the Earth orbits the Sun, and the Sun is orbited by the Earth, are parts of the a priori that don't tell us much about our world. You could understand each without knowing any um, astronomical facts, for example. Um, they're parts of pure logic, and seem to fall on the non-science side. What about Euclid's proof of the infinity of primes? Well, it is pretty clearly part of the a priori, but it also tells us something about how the world must be, about properties of groups of objects. So, um, it is not so clear that it belongs on the non-science side. The same can be said for just about all of mathematics. Then there is the psychology of understanding. It seems to have two aspects, the internal or subjective, uh, or phenomenal aspect, and the, the as it were, the what it is like aspect, and the external, objectively measurable or describable material aspect. The this neuronal state correlates with that behaviour state aspect. Now investigations of the second aspect would seem to fall naturally on the science side of the divide. Those relating to the first aspect less clearly so, and in fact some philosophers like Popper would maintain the first aspect belongs firmly on the non-science side of the divide. It would be unfeasible to have more than one demarcation divide, uh, or more than one way of drawing it. Uh, that would make the divide useless. So there must be uh, agreement, at the very least, over how the divide is to be drawn, uh, the principle according to which the demarcation is made. Now, the kind of agreement we need is usually created or constituted and maintained 
via the framing of a convention, similar in kind to the kinds of conventions established for international law, for example, by the United Nations. However, unlike the United Nations conventions, the convention needed for demarcation needs to answer to more than just the interests of parties to the agreement. It must capture within the demarcation all of those things we clearly think are part of science and provide guidance on those we are not sure about and inform us, at least in part, about why science can tell us about our world. Now we can look at two suggestions for the kind of convention we might want. One is a demarcation convention of verifiability based in rational reconstruction and the other is a demarcation convention of falsifiability based in rational criticism. Both conventions also claim to be empiricist. Now, the philosophical school known as positivism proposed a convention of verifiability. Everything on the science side of the demarcation divide should be expressible in verifiable propositions. The positivists were inductivists and their proposal is based in, on the inductivist insight that in generalizing from singular instances, that swan is white, that swan is white, and so on, to general theories, all swans are white, the meaning of the proposition expressing our general theory depends somehow on the meanings of the propositions describing the singular instances. So this gives us a criterion of verification. A proposition expressing a general theory is verifiable and so scientific if it can be reduced to propositions about singular instances. So the positivists, need, positivists sorry, needed to say something about how propositions were composed. They said the propositions expressing general theories were composed of two kinds of propositions. Analytic propositions that gave a rational structure to the theory and synthetic propositions that gave empirical content to the theory. The analytic propositions functioned uh, uh, like mortar and the synthetic propositions functioned like bricks and the wall you built uh, with them was the general theory. Uh, to extend the metaphor, science was the whole house that you build this way. Now, note that only the bricks are essential for the structure. The mortar just holds them in place, so strictly speaking, analytic propositions added nothing but structure and organisation. The positivists described this project as rational reconstruction of the knowledge science has so far gathered. And rational reconstruction is really just the flip side of, verifi of the verifiability convention of demarcation. Uh, this positivist aspect faced two significant challenges. The first centered around uh, the problem of induction. The problem of induction is that the only way to justify inductive inference as a source of knowledge is by pointing to its past success, that is, inductively. And this circular reasoning uh, at the very least carries us down an infinite regress. Now the root of the problem of induction is that no account, amount of singular instances ever adds up to the general theory. And that is why we need to resort to the reliability of induction as a general principle. Uh, this was a problem for the positivists as it meant no amount of propositions about singular instances could ever add up to the proposition expressing the general theory. So the proposition expressing the general theory always contains an unverifiable element. Now this makes the verification criterion look shaky. Uh, and this points to the second challenge. If the propositions expressing our general theories always contain an unverifiable element, then we face two unpalatable choices. One, give up on general theories and leave them with metaphysics on the non-science side of the divide, or two, give up on the, uh, given the explanation of how propositions expressing general theories were composed of propositions about singular instances, or give up on that explanation, but this would be to give up on the project of rational reconstruction altogether. So option one would get rid of most of what we want to keep inside the science side of the demarcation. Option two threatens to allow things we might intuitively want to keep on the non-science side of the demarcation in. The problem is, is that verifiability as a con is a convention and therefore there seems room for legitimate disagreement about that convention because these options conflict and that means the convention is ambiguous. 
uh, these are just two of the challenges that positive as a verifiability criterion faced. There are many others. Now, Sir Karl Popper proposed an alternative convention of falsifiability. Everything on the science side of the demarcation divide should be expressible as a proposition that experience could show to be false. Now, Popper was a deductivist, and his proposal is based on the following insight. No amount of propositions about, us, about of, of propositions about singular instances supporting a proposition expressing a general theory shows the general theory to be true. So no amount of sightings of white swans guarantees all swans are white. But it only takes one proposition about a singular instance that conflicts with a proposition expressing a general theory to show the general theory is false. A single sighting of a black swan guarantees that not all swans are white. Now, Popper draws on this insight to give us a criterion of falsification. The principle in play here is a form of inference from deductive logic uh, that we can show to be valid a priori, and it's called modus tollens. So, schematically, the form of inference looks like this. Uh, if x is a, then x is b. x is not b, therefore x is not a. It can be represented using a Venn diagram where uh, x is something that is not b, so it's outside of b there. Um, we can draw on a simple example from the history of astronomy during the period between Copernicus's proposal of the heliocentric hypothesis and the widespread acceptance of Galileo's telescopic evidence as support for the heliocentric hypothesis. We will say that the heliocentric theory combines the hypothesis and predictions it implies. So if the heliocentric hypothesis is correct, then the size of Mars should be observed to vary significantly, as in as it traverses its orbit, which is P1 there. Now P2, the size of Mars has not been observed to vary significantly as it traverses its orbit. Therefore, heliocentrism uh, or the heliocentric hypothesis is not correct. The heliocentric theory was expressible in the proposition P1 that uh, captured um, that an experience captured here in the proposition P2 uh, could show was false. So the heliocentric theory was falsifiable. Now for Popper to be clear about his criterion of falsification, how it works, he had to make sure that his convention of falsifiability did not leave any room for vagueness or ambiguity. To remove ambiguity, Popper has three requirements that scientific theories need to meet to be candidates for being uh, on the science side of the divide. In the first place, they need to represent a non-contradictory synthetic possible world. So the theory cannot be without empirical content. Uh, this rules out theories that build in contradictions because theories containing contradictions can imply contradictory predictions. Uh, everything follows from a contradiction. Uh, if you are going to say cats are not cats, then you may as well say cats are dogs. Um, as noted above, scientific theories must also fulfil the criterion of falsification, being refutable by experience. Uh, and a scientific theory must be unique. Its hypothesis must imply predictions not already implied by some other hypothesis that has no, not so far been falsified. And this cuts down on necess unnecessary duplication. And now to remove vagueness from his convention, Popper specifies a sequence of four stages of deductive analysis uh, that specifies how to drill down to the point at which the criterion of falsification can be fruitfully applied. At the first stage of analysis, we conduct intratheoretic comparison. Uh, the predictions that follow from a hypothesis are compared to ensure that they are not contradictory. If they are, this shows the hypothesis was inadmissible since it was contradictory. Uh, at the second stage of analysis, we conduct logical comparison. The predictions from the hypothesis cannot just be identical to the hypothesis. This would make the hypothesis and predictions equivalent, and hence a tautology. So this ensures theories that have empirical con ensures that theories have empirical content by carrying us from the general to the particular. At the third stage of analysis, we conduct uh, intertheoretic comparison. Uh, the predictions implied by the hypothesis are compared to those implied by other hypotheses to make sure that the theory is unique and not redundant. And at the fourth uh, stage of analysis, we conduct empirical comparison. 
uh, the predictions implied by the hypothesis, uh, compared to our experience of the world by being uh, intersubjectively tested. Theory tests should be stable, and in fact, the comparison to experience is really comparison with the results of recognisably stable tests. However, despite his best efforts, Popper does recognise that the fact that falsifiability convention is a convention, uh, or from that fact, that there will still be some room for interpretation in its application, particularly in application of the criterion of falsification. Accordingly, he tries to take up the slack in interpretation by stipulating that falsification of a theory should not be evaded by ad hoc changes in definitions of key terms, or the addition of ad hoc auxiliary hypotheses to make a theory unfalsifiable, or by simply ignoring results of tests that falsify the theory. But he cannot take up all the slack, as his convention would seem to allow some adjustments to a theory in the course of testing. For example, it seems Popper ought to be able to allow that adding the auxiliary hypotheses Galileo proposes to show telescopic observation is better uh, intersubjective, a better intersubjective test of the heliocentric theory ought to be a legitimate addition to the heliocentric theory. Now finally we can turn our attention to what seems to be the greatest weakness of the falsification criterion and in turn the falsifiability convention of demarcation the two effectively being again two sides of the one coin. The problem centres on the deductivism at the centre of Popper's criterion of falsification. The inference of modus tollens is absolute in that there is no room for probability, but this seems too inflexible because it looks like even one seeming falsifying singular instance will condemn a theory to being falsified. However, falsification occurs in the final instance through intersubjective testing, testing that could involve various kinds of apparatus. Differences in apparatus could lead to differences in testing outcomes. It would seem that we need to some degree of flexibility in the form of a probabilistic falsification. However, now the key advantage of Popper's convention of falsifiability, which was, was supposed to have, has been ceded, since we have to conclude uh, that it is improbable that one falsifying instance shows a theory to in fact be false. While sighting of a single white raven would falsify the hypothesis that all ravens are black, we should retain our original hypothesis if white raven sightings are few, since it might be more probable that white ravens are improperly formed birds or improperly formed ravens, uh, not, uh, not ravens in the truest sense, uh, then it is probable that the proposition expressing the general theory about a well-attested to regularity, the blackness of all ravens, is in fact false. So, we can recap and uh, finish. So, the first thing that we did was to talk a little about the need for demarcation. And then I went on to talk about convention as the basis for demarcation. I talked a bit about the positivist verifiability convention for demarcation. And I talked a bit about problems of ambiguity and vagueness with that convention. Um, I talked a bit about Popper's falsifiability convention as a means of drawing a demarcation. And I talked a bit about the problem of probabilistic falsification as a problem for Popper's attempt to draw that demarcation. Now, next time we'll be talking about historical analysis of scientific method. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching.